Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee, which is likely our last meeting of the um, current council. Um, as ever, we are live streamed this evening um, and we welcome anyone joining to watch us online now or in the future. Um, we have apologies this evening from Councillor Musson. Um, we're very grateful to Councillor Perrett for substituting and apologies from Councillor Cuthbertson. And we're grateful to have Councillor Fenton substituting for Councillor Cuthbertson. Um, at this point in the meeting, I'll ask if um, there are any members um, with um, disclosable pecuniary or other registrable interests that they need to declare. None, marvellous. Um, item two on our agenda um, is to ask members to consider excluding the press and public from the meeting during consideration of the um, last item on our agenda. It's Annex three and four on agenda item number nine, the salmon coloured papers in our packs. Um, that is because it contains information um, that is classed as exempt um, and needs to be kept confidential. Um, do any members have any questions about that first? Can I check everyone's content that we exclude the press and public at that point in the meeting? Yep, marvellous. What I intend to do is finish all of the other business first and then we'll move to that part just so that we're not sending people away and getting them back again um, to make it more convenient for everyone. So I hope that's OK. OK, next item then is the minutes um, of the meeting held on the 7th of February. Does anybody have any corrections first that they want to have made to those minutes? No, is everyone content then for me to sign them? Marvellous. Um, and is there anything that anyone wants to raise from those minutes? Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. It's just on the, the actions, um, particularly action point two, to, to recommend to the Chief Operating Officer and the Leader of the Council to engage the LGA about initiating a corporate peer review. I was wondering if we could get an update on that. I can give you a very brief update, Council, which is that obviously the, the action has been referred on to both the Chief Operating Officer and the Leader. Beyond that, I've not heard anything further as to whether or not that's being progressed. I can, I can only pass it on, I can't twist the round further. Thank <laughs> you. I wonder if that's something we should add to the action log, um, and then it can be tracked yeah, by the future so, committee so um, that's formed after May. Um, Okay, if we look then at the um, action log. Um, so we've got four actions. Um, oh, it's already on the action log. So <laughs> one already done for today's meeting. Marvellous, that's, that's good work. Um, so we've got two actions in relation to KCR updates, and I suggest we hold off on any discussion of those until we get to that item in the agenda, because that will make more sense. Um, and um, then the third action is around the three year review reporting to this committee. Ben, do you want to give us an update? So again, very briefly, um, whilst we are starting to consider how we're going to make that work, um, we can't obviously put a program together in, in a, a fairly short order. So my intention would be to bring an update specifically back for that, for the first audit and governance committee of the new municipal term. Any questions on any of those actions from any members? No? Okay. Um, Next item on the agenda is public participation. We have no registered speakers for this evening. So we'll move swiftly on to item five, the corporate governance report. Welcome Lorraine and Kath. Over to you. Good 
Good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, taking the report from Corporate Governance as the quarterly update to yourselves. Just as a, a quick overview of the contents and details in the report, it covers the uh, Corporate Governance Performance Indicators, uh, it covers the Information Commissioner's Office Decision Notices published uh, between this time and the last report to committee. It provides you with uh, the decisions and actions and recommendations from any ombudsman cases that we've had in that time period. So moving on to the corporate governance performance indicators. As you know, we publish these on a routine basis on the York Open Data, and you can find uh, details and links of those into the papers at point 2.2. .2. We also provide you with uh, a full list of uh, indicators at Annex 1. However, from some feedback and comments from previous reports and uh, comments from the uh, independent person, we have changed the look and feel of some of the tables that you can see in the report and also on the Ombudsman Annex. So we continue to work with internal audit to provide improved quality assurance and monitoring of our FOI and EIR responses. And also, uh, as you will see from a, a later report from Verito on the uh, complaints, so the corporate governance foresees policy and procedures. And we continue to work through those follow up actions with internal audit and managers across the council. At Annex 1, you will see at point 2.5, a table giving you the information regarding the corporate complaints and the numbers assessed as grade one or grade two and the percentage of those that have been answered in time and or out of time. There is a small decrease in the number of complaints received in the quarter three time period. This can sometimes happen in the lead up to Christmas and New Year um, and isn't indicative that uh, there will be a continuing trend. It usually comes back up in quarter four. You will see that we've uh, had a small decrease in the number of complaints responded to in time in quarter three. Again, not just blaming the festive period, but it is a peak leave period as well. So we do our best to manage those uh, leave periods and ensuring responses go out in a timely way. And hopefully in quarter four, that will start to show the increase again. So given the overall uh, in-time performance for the full year at nearer the 95% mark. Also in Annex 1 and then further on in your report, we've uh, set out a table for uh, both adults and children's social care complaints. And in quarter three, you will see that there has been an improvement in the number of children's social care complaints responded to in time, but there has been a fall in the number of adult social care complaints responded to in time. We are working very closely with the corporate director and other managers in the area to identify where there are issues in those areas about those responses. We've changed some of our team practices and being able to support those managers and adult social care to get both investigations and recommendations reports, and then the responses to the customers out in a more timely way. There has been some uh, vacancies as well, which now haven't been filled, will hopefully also help improve that in-time performance. Moving on to FOIs and EIRs and subject access request to records, uh, you will see that in quarter three, we've uh, improved the performance of uh, in-time for FOIs as well as a small increase in the EIR response times and a significant improvement in the subject access requests in time performance. That's uh, from a lot of work that the team have been doing with specific managers and service areas, especially in children's social care, where we have sometimes complex uh, subject access request records because it's for looked after children or people who have previously been in the care and now want their uh, life stories, et cetera. And, lots of information. So they can be more complex because the information is held in a number of different systems and also the ability to speak with the customer to ensure that when we release that information, we're not just doing it cold, that we support them to understand what these records are sharing and we offer them that support and guidance. Moving on to the uh, Information Commissioner's decision notices. So uh, between uh, last report to committee and to today, there time of writing the report, we've had four published decision notices. Three were not upheld and one was upheld. The three not, up, not upheld were 
because the council had applied the correct exemptions in the correct way to not disclose the information that was being requested. And the one decision notice where it was upheld was that we had not complied with the, the timeliness of response. So that's your 20 work, up to 20 working days. And I can confirm that we have now provided that substantive response to the customer. Moving on to the Ombudsman cases. Uh, so between uh, last report and this one, there's been one Housing Ombudsman Services decision, one Parliamentary and Health Services Ombudsman decision, and 17 Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman decisions. Again, they're all set out in the annex. Um, as you'll see, the annex is slightly changed and look, uh, we've pulled together the first three, four, five columns so that you hopefully can see the details of the actions and the remedies uh, a bit clearer and easier to follow. Two of the cases were not upheld or no maladministration found. Four were closed after initial inquiries as it was outside the jurisdiction of the relevant ombudsman to pursue. Seven were closed after initial inquiries with no further action for the council to take. And one was closed after initial inquiries as the council had already taken the appropriate action that the ombudsman failed would remedy the situation. There were five cases upheld where there was fault and injustice with recommendations and or remedies put in place. Uh, three of these were uh, in adult social care and integration and two were in the waste services. Uh, again, what I'll do is I'll open up to any comments or queries or questions from you on any of that information. Thanks very much. And thanks for making the changes to the layout of the reports. It does make it easier to, to track them. Any questions or comments? Councillor Fenton. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick question on the table at paragraph 2.5 <clears throat> on page 8. In, in terms of the percentage of complaints responded to in time, <clears throat> is that where you've got evidence of the response being sent either <clears throat> from the service area manager or from or from your team. So if <clears throat> if there's no evidence of a response having be, having come from the manager, do you count that as an out of time um, response? I just wanted to be clear <clears throat> whether there's a third category of not don't know whether a response has been sent within time or not. Um, it would help us to clarify that, please. So yes, you're absolutely right, Councillor Fenton. Uh, we, if we don't get copied into the response that a service manager or service area sends to the customer, or if it's not been a investigation and output that my team have done from start to finish, if we don't get that copy, then we do record it as out of time. Councillor Webb. Thanks, um, and thank you, Lorraine and Kath, for the report. Uh, it's really comprehensive, as always. So off page nine, um, you, you've sort of mentioned this a little bit, Lorraine, about the work you've been doing with the service areas. I was wondering if you could just expand a little bit about, you know, what, you know, how, firstly, how do you spot it and what investigation are you doing? How are you helping to improve things? Uh, so this is where I hand over to Kath as the operational. Uh, she is much closer in doing um, the steps that have been taken with the different service managers to identify those improvements from the themes and the lessons learned and also the practical day-to-day -day operations type things. So over to Kath. Uh, so there's been quite a few different things really because we've got some new managers that have come in as well. So I guess some of that just starts with making sure people know what we're expecting them to do, how we're expecting them to deal with complaints, what our timescales are, you know, response templates and all of those kind of things. So it's kind of that initial training and support. Um, some of the issues around kind of making sure that we're uh, clearing the information that we're giving them and working with them around kind of what's working for them, what isn't working for them. We've done some more work around updating some of the reports that are available to people on things like the KPI machine so that managers can track some of that. And then myself meeting with managers to kind of go through any questions that they've got and be able to see clearly who's actually, who complaints are allocated to and what kind of stage they're at. And we've included in there the due date for things as well so they can see very clearly this is when it's due, this is who's dealing with it. 
Um, we're obviously sending things like the reminders, but we're also asking managers if they need any help with things like, do you want us to help you with some of the QAing of the response? Do you want us to help you with some of the kind of setting out how to respond to things and doing some of that support training, drafting things for people? Um, and even where they've agreed something and we know that it's kind of that's how they want it, do they actually want us to send it out for people? So is there some work that we can take off people if they're busy and they've got lots of other things on that we can help you with so lots of talking to people asking them what they need from us and seeing what we can actually do to take on some of those tasks where that might be helpful councillor fisher okay. yes thank you for the report i think this is really generally moving in the right direction um, one thing intrigues me though if you look at the freedom of information responses the total in 2019 to 20 was 1422 if we assume that the rate for the quarter four will be approximately the same as the first three quarters we're down to about 700 700 to 750 do you have any reason why that is were there some areas originally areas of the council that were attracting a lot of freedom of information responses or not or is it just people are not bothering to put them in nowadays I think it, it's also about recognising where it's a business, what we call a business as usual question. So if it's information that we can supply with un, under the FOI legislation, if you can supply it immediately, usually within we set around a five working day time scale for that, you can answer it outside of the FOI legislation. Uh, so if it is that we, we know that the service area can provide that information in that timely, in that immediate fashion, there isn't a requirement even under the FOI legislation to treat it as an FOI. Uh, so there has been uh, through training and identifying and understanding uh, what information may already be out there. So uh, again, within my team, if we know that there's been some already answered or already published etc we will push that proactive response so that it doesn't actually ever get to service it goes out through uh, business as usual uh, immediate answer uh, there is also uh, the fact that we're better at identifying uh, and recording we've separated out both the FOIs and the EIR requests as well so that although they still don't uh, add up to the previous uh, levels pre-lockdown. Um, I think that has also made an impact. We did lose uh, a drop in requests during lockdown and during the last couple of years, but I suspect it may very well pick up again. But we are keeping an eye on uh, what that trend, what it is saying, what information is out there. We're being better at proactively uh, and with support from business intelligence, looking at what information we can get out there onto the York Open data. So that again, whilst that doesn't stop an FOI uh, coming in and it doesn't uh, mean that we don't answer it under FOI where required, we can usually point that information direct out to here's where it's already published please let us know we've also got our disclosure log on the website uh, and also we've got our publication scheme on the website so hopefully that all together all that work does look hopefully people are looking for the information first rather than just coming and asking thank you for that comprehensive answer any more questions comments councillor fenton I suppose just <clears throat> following on from that, picking up Councillor Fisher's point, it does look like a sort of dramatic decrease in FOIs, but obviously I'm right in thinking the, number, the volume of queries is largely the same, <clears throat> just that we're classing fewer of them as an FOI. And can we do that if the person uses the words freedom of information in the email of their request or the letter of their request? Thank you. Yes, you can. If the, the, the legislation does set out uh, where you can treat it as, a, we call it a business as usual request, it's, and the wording is if you can answer it immediately or straight away, and it's information that you don't have to consider any exemptions. So if it's information that you can supply in full, then by all means, just get on and answer it. And that's what the ICO would also expect. Um, what we have done is well in the team is we are recording different types of cases and uh, we have seen whilst these figures might be uh, shown a decrease uh, the figures across all the casework and the corporate governance team has shown quite a steady significant increase uh, year on year uh, and so yeah it's the casework still there yeah yeah <laughs>
Thank you. No final thoughts or questions? In that case, um, can I just make sure that members are happy to note the report and we thank you for it, much appreciated. <clears throat> so now move on to item number six, external audit progress report. And I believe that we have um, colleagues from Mazaz joining us remotely. Have we got you, Mark and Mark and Helen? Hello. Hello, welcome. Thanks, Chair. I'll take you through the report. Uh, I don't propose to turn the pages, but I'll highlight the key messages in our report for you this evening. Page four of the report confirms that while we have completed our WGA submission for 2021, we are unable to issue the certificate as the National Audit Office has not confirmed those councils that require full group audit procedures. We will keep you informed when we have clarity in that regard. In relation to our 21-22 audit, we can confirm that we've completed our audit work, including our review of infrastructure assets with no significant issues to report today. We are now in the completion and closure steps of the audit and plan to issue our opinion uh, in the very near future. We will also issue an audit completion follow-up letter to those charged with governance, highlighting our findings since issuing the audit completion report back in November 2022. As explained in the progress report, we've also not been able to start our all of governance accounts work for 2022. And again, we'll complete this once we've finished our audit opinion work. And again, you'll note that we haven't finalised our value for money work and we plan to issue our annual auditors report three months after the opinion is um, finalised in line with the National Audit Officer's time frame. On pages six and seven, we highlight two risks of significant weakness, which may be considered as part of our 21-22 value for money work. Those being um, follow-up of the public interest report issued in the prior year, and the other is consideration of an Ofsted report, which was issued in March 2022. Page eight highlights the significant risks we expect to include in our audit plan for 22-23, which we hope to bring to the next committee along with the annual auditor's report for 2122. Section two provides members with an update on auditing standard IAS 315, highlighting the additional work we expect to complete in regard to understanding the entity, particularly around IT controls, IT systems, and a more granular approach to understanding your key business processes. Finally, section three highlights some useful uh, publications, which we hope you will find helpful and concludes the report. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mark. Any questions from members? Councillor Webb? Hi, Mark. Um, can you hear me? I can, loud and clear. Excellent, thank you. Um, obviously, you have highlighted two significant um, weaknesses. Um, obviously, one we've talked about many, many times before uh, relating to the leader of the council's um, payout and the, the PIR that resulted from that. Um, obviously, the council has sort of come up with a plan on how to improve governance, and there have been uh, moves to improve things around our policies. Um, could you explain a little bit about why this is sort of still in here now and then on the second um, area of significant weakness um, the children's services Ofsted reports again sort of what work have you done with council officers to sort of seek assurances that things are being improved uh, or does that work come later thank you councillor I'll start with the second one because that one's probably easier so um 
by virtue of the National Audit Officer's guidance on how we comment on value for money work, we have to consider the work of any regulators and any outputs from any regulators. So this report is just highlighting, highlighting a risk of weakness. It's not saying it actually is. So at this stage, we haven't completed um, any sort of work in that regard, but we have obviously read what Ofsted had said. And unfortunately, we can't really reflect on it in a progress report. And we will follow up on that in the next, uh, in the coming weeks, once we get the audit opinion out of the way. And then secondly, in regard to the public interest report, again, we recognise the hard work that's been put in, the action plan and all of that good stuff. But we were just going to reflect on the LGA's recent report and um, consider that in our annual report for 21-22. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense, really. The LGA report was pretty stark. So, um, yeah. That, that all makes sense and thanks for your work. No problem. Any other comments or questions from members? No? I think um, bearing in mind we've got an outstanding action relating to the, the LGA report and the, the three-year plan. I think it'll be important to, to record that, you know, we, we'd clearly be keen to hear any feedback from yourselves that, that can help inform that three-year plan um, to, to take forward any of the, any of the um, recommendations that came out of that final LGA report, because um, I think that'll be crucial, especially forming a, a new council post May. If there are no other questions, comments, then we thank you very much, Mark and Mark, um, for your presence, virtual presence this evening, um, and um, look forward to seeing the outcome of the audit at future meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs> about the presentation of the agenda as my eyesight is unfortunately for close range is deteriorating rapidly i can't read that font and if i blow it up on my computer it is literally vast and i can't i, I find it very difficult to read it in that font is there any way that could be presented in a slightly different way or i could make arrangements to have that done so i can so i can actually see clearly i'm, I'm sure we can sort that and Thank I, you. I, hopefully mark um We'll have, we'll have heard that and maybe some consideration can be given to the accessibility of the documents yeah. so that we can make sure we can meet everybody's needs um, and make sure everyone can can access every, all the information they need. If it was 30 feet away, I could read it fine, but unfortunately... <laughs> I don't think the room's big no. enough, Councillor Fisher, so so we'll, we'll go with trying to increase the font. Um, thank you very much. Um, move on now to agenda item number seven, the key corporate risks monitor. Oh, Helen, we've got Helen remotely. Hi, can you hear me? Ah, oh, hello, Helen. Welcome. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you. And apologies that I'm not there in person this evening. Um, so I'm bringing to you the third and final monitor of the council's key corporate risks. Although my report does say it's monitor three of 2324, I think I've got a bit ahead of myself. Um, it should say 2223. Obviously, was building the budget at that point. So the key corporate risks have been reviewed and updated in consultation with corporate management team once again. Uh, within the report, uh, the background is information that members of the committee will have seen before. This usually appears in, in these updates. At paragraph 14 and 15, uh, I've provided updates which were referred to earlier in terms of the action log, um, although I haven't actually referred to them by number. So paragraph 14, um, in terms of KCR2, where members asked to have um, a further control added to KCR2 in terms of a recommendation to council in regards to the LGA report 
I've actioned that now on the risk register at Annex A. Um, and then the second um, action within the log, uh, which I think was number six, which related to bringing complete updates on KCR 8, the local plan, and KCR 12, major incidents. Um, the plan is to bring um, full updates to, the, um, to both those KCRs um, at the next meeting of this committee in July, um, mainly because the, the way both of those um, KCRs are progressing, it will be probably more relevant to bring more information at that point when things have, have developed a bit further. Um, in particular on KCR 12 major incidents, I understand from the director of place that we're awaiting guidance um, to be updated by central government. So um, that's why those haven't been brought to you this evening. Um, and then further on in the report, paragraph 16 to 22, uh, actually outline key uh, updates that have been made to each risk. Um, but further detail, details, excuse me, of these can be found um, at the annex at page, starts at page 53. So I'm happy to take any comments or questions on the report or annexes from members. Thank you. Questions, comments? Councillor Fisher. My comment, my comment is possibly more for the monitoring office than anyone else. If we look at on page 77, we have the threat of a serious incident, such as possibly a terrorist attack or a major fire. Can you just explain if we are advised by, say, the fire service or a security agency that there is a significant threat and we don't act on it, would that invalidate our public liability insurance and leave the council liable to major insurance? Um, mm -hmm. insurance without yeah. looking at the detail of the policy, I, right. I can't say uh, for certain. I think more fundamentally, there would be um, a reputational risk that would flow from that and obviously a financial risk. Yeah. Um, whether or not we are covered under our insurers is in some ways uh, secondary to those considerations because whether or not we get the money back is, is, is yeah. less, less important than, than the, the, the catastrophic event that may have occurred. So it would lead the council liable to considerable possibility. Of Potentially so. Yeah, thank you for that. I, th I think without without you know, details of what we're talking about and exactly how things might might happen in the future, I can't say. No, but just, just, the, the just, risk is certainly there. It's just a concern. So when you look at what happened with Grenfell Tower, where there were clear, clear instructions from a, a building agency that the building was unsound and the council did nothing. You know, I just don't want to see York put in that position. We have to act on best advice. Thank you. Councillor Fenton. Thank you, Chair. Um, KCR 2, um, given that we've, governance, given that we've recently agreed to go ahead with the combined authority, mayoral combined authority, um, would it be worth at some point this committee thinking about potential risks that arise from that arrangement for this authority? Um, I was trying to think what those might be, but I'm sure there might be some. Um, so, yeah, it might be worth for a future committee to, to mull over combined authority potential risks. Thank you, Councillor Fenton. Interesting point. I see Braden's got his hand up, and then I'll see if Helen's got any more thoughts. I suppose just on, on observation on that is ultimately the question becomes is it a key corporate risk for the council or is it a risk for elements of directorates which which might then fall into directorate risk registers until we've looked at it we don't know but i suppose it's that distinction of as to you know does it fundamentally affect the, the whole council or just parts of it i don't know if you've got anything you want to add helen thank you um no i think i just echo what bryn said that we'd need to review the risks that were there and then make a decision about whether it needed adding into the york risk register as a key corporate risk thank you i wonder if we should put an action on the action log to look at this when we have more detailed information available I, i'm not sure i know when that might be the case but i think it's a really important point i think we should capture it 
Thank you, Chair. So um, the creation of the authority is scheduled for November this year. So I would expect that sometime in the late summer, we'll have much more information from the government about exactly what, um, what will be envisaged and, and the statutory instruments they'll be putting forward. So I would suspect that towards the end of this year is probably the time to look at those risks uh, and see whether or not um, there's anything to, to achieve. So perhaps we can have an action um, for you to look at the work plan for um, the new new council year um, and, and find a space to, to put that piece of work in because I think that will be really important. We can absolutely do that, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? No, I've, I do have a question uh, on um, KCR 8, the local plan. So, um, I saw the update, which is really helpful. Um, and later this year, you anticipate that, that this KCR will be considered for removal from, from the risk register. Um, I just wonder if there are other aspects of the local plan, so not its existence, but if there are things in the local plan that may actually become risks in themselves. So if the local plan, is an obstacle to delivering some of our major projects, um, things like that. I wonder if we still need to be considering the local plan, but perhaps a different perspective. Um, and, and maybe it's more about its interaction with some of the other risks on the register. Um, but I think that's probably, again, I think every item now we've said, that's something to look at <laughs> after May. Um, but I, I wonder if, you know, in, in when that is looked at for consideration for removal, it'd be good to, to look at how the local plan interacts with other things, Bryn. Yeah, I think that may end up being a new corporate risk if there is an issue there. So the corporate risk that we're looking at here is not getting a local plan at all. And I think once we've actually had that adopted, that risk will naturally drop away. Whether or not there's then something new that comes along as a result is, is perhaps a separate issue. Um, and again, it will come down to the detail of what it is and whether or not it becomes a director at risk, particularly for place, or whether it's a, a council-wide risk. Councillor Webb. So on, on this, because I think this is a, a, a worthy conversation, really, for, for the point in the municipal cycle we're in, really, um, given that there will be a new A&G committee um, made up of some, all or none of us um, after May, is there a question about how a key corporate risk is decided upon that maybe needs to be discussed or explained or talked about by that new audit and governance committee? And is that a, maybe something for the work plan to think about for that new cycle? Yes, you're right. I mean, the, the, where it's a key corporate risk, it's something that's been considered carefully by officers um, and, and we will always discuss it here at this committee as well. So as you know, you're an overview of the process of ensuring that we recognise, mitigate and monitor our key corporate risks. And whilst we inevitably get into conversations about what they are and your opinions on them, actually your remit is to make sure that we're managing the process properly. So if we were to say, say we've got the local plan agreed and we decided it was no longer a key corporate risk, we would bring that here to discuss that with you and say that this is what we think and you would we would have that debate and, and we would go from there. And in the same way that if we, um, a new issue, as it did with COVID or something else, uh, Brexit, all those other things, where, where we, we go through our risk management process, Helen will meet with all the directors throughout the year and their management teams and regularly gather information about risks. They can often be mitigated and managed, but where it comes to the point where it starts to become, this is wider, this is wider than one directorate, this is something you know a key corporate risk then that would get added onto the register and again that would come here and um whilst if we were removing a risk we might come and say we're going to remove a risk what do you think if we were adding a risk we probably would tell you that we were adding a risk <laughs> we wouldn't come and say what do you think because if we thought it was a risk i mean i'm pretty sure you would agree anyway if we thought it was a risk but so it would just be about that process so it's, it's um but what you see is a kind of quarterly snapshot of something that happens all the time, if that makes sense. So it would carry on, you know, whilst the new administration 
sorts itself out and the new members of uh, an audit committee get settled in, this process will, will carry on. Yeah, I wonder, Debbie, if you can remember what you just said and say that after May to whoever starts afresh, because I think that's quite useful, really, to sort of get that overview. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any last thoughts, questions? In that case, I think we have considered and commented on the key corporate risks and provided feedback. Um, so thank you very much, Helen. We do appreciate your, your attendance and your report. <laughs> and we shall move on now to agenda item um, number eight, the internal audit and counter fraud work programs. And I see Max and Connor have joined us. Um, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So. Uh, we've completed our consultation and planning work um, for next year's work programmes. Um, so today we're uh, presenting two work programmes. First of all, the internal audit work programme. Um, as in, in previous years, it's risk-based, it's high level, it's designed to be flexible. Um, but we also have made sure that the sufficient coverage of the key assurance areas that we require to be able to provide a, uh, an adequate opinion. Um, so those assurance areas, are they're set out in paragraph 10 of the uh, report. Um, I'd probably just make a few other uh, points. We will keep the, the internal audit work programme under review and to change it and adapt it as uh, new risks emerge, priorities change and so on. Um, but we will keep uh, the Audit and Governance Committee updated in terms of what those changes are and how it's affecting the work that we're, we're, we're undertaking. Um, the, the list which is uh, attached um, is it is a longer list than we can actually effectively deliver so we, we are deliberately over programming uh, and again that's to I suppose recognise the fact that there will be changes, there will inevitably be delays in starting some work. So we, we try and build that, that into the uh, program. Uh, so that's the internal audit uh, work program uh, for next year. Um, we, in Annex 2, we've also summarised the uh, work and activities that we expect to undertake on the counter fraud side. Um, we, 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 we just explain what those areas are we don't try and allocate uh, days to those those headings simply because it's it's quite difficult to predict um, a lot of it depends on the the number of referrals that we get and the the complexity of the cases that we have to investigate so there's a, there is a degree of again some flexibility in terms of the allocation of resources to those those headings so um, uh, we are asking the committee to approve the internal audit work programme uh, for the counter fraud programme, which is really to note. So happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Questions or comments from members? Councillor Fenton. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the <clears throat> report. I don't have any um, I suppose, objections to anything on the list. It all seems eminently sensible. I just wanted to better understand on page 95, the second from the top, section 106 agreements. I just wonder if you could explain a little bit more about what aspect of section 106 agreements. Is it end-to-end -end in terms of <clears throat> how projects are identified that would potentially benefit from section 106 contribution or the process through which contributions are collected and then allocated and then spent? If it's all of those things, great, but I just, want, I just wanted to, to better understand if you were focusing on a particular <clears throat> aspect that, that may have, may have um, come to your attention. Um, in, in terms of that audit, we haven't uh, agreed the, the, the scope of the actual work. However, I, I would expect it's more likely to be the latter. So it's the, it's the collection, mon recording, monitoring of Section 106 payments. Yeah. Councillor One. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
so, so you were saying there's a lot on the list here. You don't expect to get round to all of it. I guess if this adds up to 1,023 indicative days, do you have a feel for how many days worth of, of availability you have? So in terms of not getting too scientific, but um, per the list that we've set out there comes to probably about a thousand days plus in terms of work, not um, including the two elements that we have around of assurance work and client liaison, which, you know, so we, do, we work at around 840 days of pure audit delivery. We probably have been around 1,040 days based on that. So it's kind of about 20% over capacity. But what we will be doing is by over-programming, as Max said, we can, we can be quite nimble and respond. So we actually have already prioritized audits ready to go if for whatever reason, you know, an audit needs to drop from the program or it needs to be replaced with another. So that's the reason for, for, for working in that particular fashion. So would you say there are things on this list that you know you can actually get on with immediately because you've already done some of the, the groundwork, if you like? Absolutely, yeah. So as part of putting the, the programme together, we go through consultation, which started with yourselves, but then ended pretty much with senior management. Uh, so part of those conversations that we'll have will not only be, in some respects, discussing aspects of scope or priorities for their next upcoming 12 months, would actually be when is most suitable to deliver the work. So behind this, we have working papers which support the development of this programme. Um, quite a lot goes on behind the scenes and uh, we use our do now, do next, do later prioritisation, which you'll have seen in previous iterations of our progress reports. So we already have a good idea about what's lined up for quarter one and quarter two and then onwards. So that's all part of the process of coming up with this programme. Any other comments or questions from members? No? Bryn? Just before we close then, can I put on record my thanks to Max and Connor and the team for the sterling work they do and the extraordinary effort they put into all of this? Absolutely. I'm sure that's, I saw nods as you said that, so um, I'm sure that's echoed around the table. Um, so thank you very much. Um, for that and, and thanks for taking on board the, um, the feedback that, that we gave. Um, I think the meeting before last, wasn't it? Um, uh, so members were being asked to approve the um, internal audit work program and to note the counter fraud work program. Is everybody content to do that? Marvellous. Excellent. Um, so we shall move on now to um, item uh, nine, the audit and counter fraud progress report and remind members um, that at this point we're only dealing with those items that are printed on white paper in our packs. Um, and what we'll do before we go on to, to um, comment on any of the detail in the restricted section, um, we'll, we'll deal with item 10 at that point so that we can then allow everybody else to carry on with their evenings um, while we just finish that, that bit um, without the presence of the public. Everybody okay with that, happy with that? All right, Max and Connor, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this is our regular progress report where we provide details of the uh, internal audit and counter fraud work that we've completed since the last progress report, which was um, uh, back in uh, the end of November. Um, within the report, we also provide details of the uh, audit reports that we've uh, issued either in draft or, or final, uh, as well as uh, follow-up testing that we've completed. Uh, so this Again, there's two parts to the report. The first part, Annex 1, uh, covers internal audit work. Um, so within that, uh, the co committee will note that we've uh, finalised eight reports in the period, uh, and we've also issued a further seven reports in draft. And we do expect to finalise uh, those drafts uh, over the next few weeks, as well as complete uh, the other work that's currently in progress and certainly uh, to have uh, issued reports on those audits 
uh, in time for the June meeting when we'll provide the, the annual opinion uh, on, on the council's uh, arrangements. Um, so uh, the details of the findings and outcomes of the, the eight reports that we've finalized in the period are shown in Appendix B. Um, so it provides uh, a summary of the, the issues that we identified and the actions that are now being taken by management to address uh, any weaknesses that we identified. Um, so that's, I suppose, the internal audit work. Counter fraud work, uh, that's summarised in Annex 2. Uh, that sets out the sort of activities and outcomes of recent work uh, in that area. Um, we've, the committee will note, we've continued to raise awareness of the risks of fraud within the council. Uh, we've also provided uh, training to some specific, specific uh, staff groups. Um, uh, we have uh, supported the council uh, in submitting data to the National Fraud Initiative. So this is a, a national process where council uh, data from councils across the country are, are matched along with other uh, public bodies to identify potential fraud. So that that data was submitted. We've now started to get the, uh, the data matches back. And uh, to date, we've had uh, 7,500 matches back, which is quite a considerable number. So that will take some time to uh, work through. And what we're looking for is to see whether any of those matches are indicating potential fraud, which then needs to be investigated. Uh, we've also uh, provided um, 40 responses to the DWP for requests for information. Um, and I suppose the only other thing to note really is that we are on track to achieve the uh, targeted say uh, the target for fraud savings uh, that we have for the year. So happy to take any comments or questions uh, on the report. Thank you. Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. Um, on page 107 of our report, which is sort of this page three of Annex 1. Uh, paragraph 12, uh, I was wondering if you could just explain what it means. <laughs> uh, so it says these audits have now been deferred to 23-24 to make priority for other work uh, and to allow the work to be rescoped and aligned with changing priorities in the place director. I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, what's brought about the change and the delay and things like that. Um, I think it's, um, it, it, it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally we will start an audit. It's, it's been agreed, we, we make a start, and then for uh, then reason, there will be reasons why it's no longer um, appropriate to continue and it's best to defer it. And in this case, those were two, two audits where uh, through discussions with director was just decided that it was best to just wait uh, a while i think connor can provide a bit more detail on on what those reasons were yeah essentially that's that's right i would say for particularly the, the asset management one where we talk about place priorities the way it was scoped at the time was for us to to do some work at the, the depot on assets that were used on particular jobs in relation to uh, property uh, and then highways um, since having that meeting, we've, we've progressed our work on another audit juice and managed stores contracts, which has given us some assurance in areas which we may have potentially duplicated with the programme that we had in place. So we felt rather than have like a two pronged approach to asset verification, essentially would be the audit, but actually we go take a step back and also given um, the committee's comments around potentially having a look at uh, council house repairs as an area and maybe refocus on that and have a, perhaps a a broader audit which which encompasses that uh, a bit more broadly um, I think with continuing healthcare is one that started and then in terms of the service uh, I think they felt that their competing pressures and priorities meant that perhaps it would be worthwhile us pausing and revisiting so it isn't off the agenda it's actually on the program if you sort of compare and contrast reports you'll see that it's on there so part of the final bit of consultation uh, where we haven't had explicit kind of confirmation when that audit is acceptable to to undertake will be to reconfirm with them what should we do and when. So it's it is an unusual situation as Max sort of mentioned, but um, there are merit in both cases for the deferrals. Thank you. 
Any other comments or questions? Councillor Wan. In Annex, which Annex is it? B, uh, sorry, Appendix B, uh, page 112, we return to the commercial waste uh, issue, which seems to have come up quite a lot over the, the past few years. And as it currently stands, no opinion is given. I just wondered where that sort of outcome would come from and how long you would continue to not give an opinion before giving another poor opinion on that particular service. Okay, I think in, in, in this with this work, we were we were following up a number of specific recommendations. So we weren't we weren't providing a sufficiently broad we were undertaking a sufficiently broad piece of work to provide an opinion. So it was we were just checking some particular issues, uh, and in particular whether the management were you know were doing what they said they were going to do. So that that's it, it's it's just we're not in a position. We don't feel comfortable providing a, an opinion based on a fairly narrow piece of work, an important piece of work because we were following up previous um, recommendations, which, as as the committee can see, some had been addressed and others hadn't. When. When will this likely come back to us again, or, or when when will you revisit this particular issue to, to find out whether they have uh, addressed these, these points? Uh, we we will continue to follow these issues up until we're satisfied that everything's been sufficiently addressed. Clearly, if we if we're not satisfied that they've been addressed, or they're just taking too long, or or, or there are other risks that are starting to emerge. We will then either do well. We'll, we'll we'll inform the committee, but we'll also consider doing a wider piece of work. So it's very much on our radar. Mm -hmm. Councillor Webb. Thank you. Um, on the the next page, the uh, complaints, concerns, comments, and compliments section. Um, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure that this is a question necessarily about this section, but it made me think about the issue. Um, there's currently at the very bottom of the page and on the comments and issues identified, there's currently no quality assurance process in place to ensure the responses to complaints and feedback are of good quality and meet policy expectations. On a broader point, and members might agree or disagree with me about this, but sometimes when you submit a concern through member inquiries um, and you get a response that is essentially completed or not the council's concern it's like well that's not the question that was asked the question was asked was well how do we fix the problem and when that is the line that you get back it's not very helpful now that might have something or nothing to do with this particular piece here but i just thought it um, maybe I should have mentioned it earlier when you were looking at the work plan, but uh, is something that I think is important to note that it's a real source of frustration and often leads to duplication, repeating of work, delays, nothing getting solved, things like that. <coughs> Sorry, rant over. Can I suggest that the rain jumps in? Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> thank, thank you, Lorraine. Uh, apologies for bringing it up and sorry for stealing your thunder there, Max and Tom. Sorry, you don't mind if I, I, I respond. So, um, whilst we were doing this audit uh, uh, around the quality assurance and working with Connor and his colleagues, um, members' inquiries absolutely did come into focus. Uh, however, members' inquiries is not part of the complaints process, it's not part of the uh, corporate governance team, it is part of customer service and where you're not getting a suitable or you're dissatisfied with the response, they will and or should or yourselves can escalate into the complaints process um, where there is, so you're dissatisfied with the response or the timeliness of the response or you don't feel it's answered the questions raised through the members inquiries portal and route. Um, we do work very closely with uh, customer services on that and ensuring that where there is that transfer into the complaints process or how we can support them in answering in a 
more timely way is or even if it's has to go down the FOI route or has to go down one of the other processes that falls within corporate governance we aim to try and ensure that your response is that's telling you that it isn't just that we've dealt with it and it's our time scales done but here's what we've done with it here's who's dealing with it here's your contact and here's your time scale go ahead um on a similar vein to everything we've been talking about tonight it, i think clarity around that process at the start of the next municipal cycle for all councillors will be useful i'm warning you now it's going to generate you a lot of work but um I, I think it's something that would be really beneficial because I, I think that is a process the, from from sort of a member's side that I think is really not quite working necessarily that well. And it's it's sometimes it works brilliantly. It does work really, really well. But a lot of the time it can be quite frustrating when no response comes through. And I'm sure that actually back on, on this sort of section of the report here, there is a similar concern around um, members of the public and, and the responses that they're getting as well. And, and I think putting some sort of quality insurance in place, assurance in place is really important. But yeah, I thought it's... I'm just, I'm just going to jump in there yeah. um, because I, I wonder if that's actually something that the first part of that could be added to the member induction programme, looking well, at Bryn. Paul Bryn's member induction is getting more and more detailed, but I, I think that would be really good to have um, a member of, of, of your team, Lorraine, to, to, to talk to members at that point and, and make sure that they're equipped with all that they need to be able to follow things through. Yeah, absolutely. I, we are on the members induction uh, planning programme and uh, what I'll do is I'll link back into customer services and if that isn't already on as a, a separate item about using and the use of the members book, because my apologies, I can't remember if it is. I think it might be, but I'll take it away and make sure that it, if it isn't, it is and then work closely with customer services to bring it back. Marvellous. Thank you. Councillor Fenton. Thank you. <clears throat> on the same the same issue my reading of the that the text at the bottom of page 113 in terms of quality assurance of the responses i mean i've <clears throat> i've been copied in some responses that the um <clears throat> the resident has, has been they've been inflamed by the response not necessarily the content but how they perceived some of the um the, the, the way in which the response was phrased. So I'm guessing this picks up on perhaps some of that. Um, I suppose it, it, it's arguably more difficult when the, the team that was audited isn't actually sending the response. If it's been delegated to the uh, someone in a service area who is responding to the customer, you have very little control over how, <clears throat> how that response is, is kind of phrased. And it may be along the lines of, Council Web's example, Web, Web's example of, well, we couldn't find it, so we, yeah, end of story, correspondence closed. Um, so it's probably not, not for a discussion now, but it'll be interesting to see how, <laughs> how you address that aspect of the recommendation, given that you are one step removed from, from some of those responses, which, which I, yeah, and I've seen some that <clears throat> do sort of vary in, um, in, in quality, but not through any, <clears throat> not through any member staff thinking, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll send a, what I think will be a, a not very well received response. It, sometimes, sometimes they're just received um, in a way by someone who is already unhappy because they felt the need to come make a complaint in the first place. Thank you. Councillor Webb. Yeah, and just to finish off that point, really, I, I think that, you know, we recognise that all these officers, members of the council, staff are under extreme pressure and are probably doing many many things all at once and you know it's in earlier points we've talked about you know what can your team do to support those other teams with workload and things like that and i think that this comes into it as well um so yeah <laughs> i think it's something that needs addressing is there anything else you want to add to lorraine just yes that is what we're all with um absolutely yeah Marvellous. Wonderful that you were here to jump in on that. Um, 
Max and Connor, I don't know if there's anything you want to add on that. I think Lorraine's covered it very well. So. Marvellous. <laughs> Any other comments, questions from members at this point? Councillor Fisher. Thank you. Uh, page one, one look, uh, looking at the short breaks. Um, it does seem to me here to be the potential for some money to be wasted in terms of looking at the fact that there are no controls, no checks. And it says no major actions have agreed, recommendations are made. Have those recommendations, any of those actually been followed up yet? Because, you know, I'm not sure how big the budget is on this, but it does strike me that perhaps the controls need to be brought in sooner rather than later. Um, so I, I suppose the first point I'd make is that the service themselves were already aware that there were problems right. and we were, we were invited to help them identify what those issues were and what the possible solutions were. So um, we, we, we issued a, it was more a consultancy type report. So we, we said, we, we told them what they probably already knew, but we also listed a number of areas where we, we suggested they, they should, should um, make changes, certainly make improvements. So that, that, that was the nature of the report. But there were, I think they were all accepted though. I don't think there was any sort of challenge to, to what we were saying. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If there's nothing else, I'll ask you to press pause on that item um, while I just go back to our, our main agenda. Um, and for item 10, we have no urgent business. Um, so what I intend to do now is to um, say goodbye to the, the members of the public um, who might be watching and we'll We'll close the meeting at this point to them. Um, we'll carry on and, and just deal with the last um, uh, section of that um, item nine. Um, but uh, we'll say goodbye now to members of the public.